My name is uh, Bjarte Buchnes, and it's wonderful to be on the road again. And it's wonderful to be back in Paris. So thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you do that when I'm finished as well. <laughs> the author Douglas Adams, he once said that I might not have gone where I intended to go, but I think I ended up where I needed to be. And I'm sharing these words because it was not a given that I should stand here today and talk about beyond budgeting. Because my first management job in a company called Statoil, now Equinor, after I graduated from business school, was head of the corporate budget department. I've been heading up more budget processes in my life than I want to be reminded about. I have done a lot of stupid things in my life, but I have learned, and it also means that I know what I'm talking about. And when I talk about beyond budgeting, there's one word that keeps coming up over and over again, and the word is control. And the context is the fear of losing control. When I ask people, what do you mean with control? What are you so afraid of losing? After people have said cost control, many go quiet. They actually struggle with putting words on what they are so afraid of losing. So I checked up Oxford Dictionary, and they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what does this mean in organizational terms? Well, it basically means controlling people and controlling the future. And behind these two lies the two main assumptions that underpins so much in traditional management. Number one, you can't trust people. Number two, the future is predictable and planable. And we are challenging both those beliefs heavily in Beyond Budgeting because we believe these are nothing but illusions of control. For instance, that people can and must be managed. Well, of course, you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, either they leave or they find their way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. And the pandemic has actually proven both of these, not just that the future is predict unpredictable, but also that pe most people can be trusted. Look at all the homework, the home offices, right? Companies were forced to trust people, even if they didn't want to. And guess what? As you all know, generally, it worked. So there was something positive coming out of the pandemic. Wise people out there agreed with what I've just said. When it comes to people, good old Peter Drucker, most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. And I couldn't agree more, because sometimes the problem is that we manage too much. Talking about people and trust, I used to travel a lot before the pandemic. And the first thing I always checked when I opened the hotel door was what kind of clothing hangers did they have. And you recognize the two, and I think we all agree that we hate the one at the bottom. It's very cumbersome to use. So how come some hotels offer us these stupid hangers? Well, maybe because once uh, maybe a few guests stole one of those hangers with a hook. And what was the response? To punish everybody because somebody did something wrong. Actually, one of the problems with traditional management. When it comes to the future, another wise person, Russell Aikoff, he compared a lot of the corporate planning he was observing with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I know what Ekov is talking about here, because I have done a lot of dancing in my life. I don't really think it improved the performance of the organization. All right, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that 100 years ago invented a fantastic machine. State of the art, crucial for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble, and today, this machine is completely broken, kaput. You will all understand that this is not the true story, because in real life, people would have gotten together 50 years ago and done something. Either try to fix this machine, or even better, try to invent something new and much better, because innovation is something we all love, right? Innovation is great, wonderful. We all want to be leading edge, unique, right on the forefront, 
better than everybody else. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation into products and services. But there is also something called management innovation that we shall talk about today. Exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that is not great. That is scary. Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? The consequence is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. Everybody is into this kind of innovation in some form or shape. All your competitors. Management innovation, on the other hand, is not yet a crowded place because it's scary. Which actually is good news for brave companies who dare to explore, embrace also this kind of innovation because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage from management innovation as you can get from technology innovation. There are companies out there who openly admit that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce, what we sell, what we provide. We find it in the way we lead and manage. And I've got a few examples for you a bit later. So it's all about performance defined in the right way. That is why we should go beyond budgeting, because it's good for performance. So I will come back to that important word. But before that, it is after all called beyond budgeting. It has something to do with budgets and budget problems. So I quickly want to share with you my budget problem list, just to check if you are in the same place here when it comes to the frustration. Uh, it's a very time-consuming process, making budgets, following up budgets, assumptions quickly outdated, again, the pandemic, another example of that. This is a serious problem. Budgeting can stimulate what I would call unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the internal negotiations. A big problem. Although I'm not necessarily blaming people behaving like that, because they are simply responding to the system. So we shouldn't focus on fixing people, we should focus on fixing the system. That will change people's behavior. It can create these illusions of control that we talked about. And if you don't have control, whatever it means, it's better to accept and acknowledge that and act accordingly than to think that we have control and act accordingly. Budgets force us to make decisions too early. We have to decide in the autumn, the year before, what we shall do next year and what it shall cost. And sometimes, too many of these decisions are taken too high up. doesn't always improve the quality of decisions. Budgets can prevent us from doing things that we should have done, but we can't because it's not in the budget. But this also works the other way around. It can lead us to do things that we maybe shouldn't have done, but it is in the budget and it is spend it or lose it. You know the game. And linked to this, I accept that a cost budget can be a very effective ceiling on cost. But let's not forget that those budgets are just effect as effective as a floor in the sense that these budgets tend to be spent for the reasons that we just discussed. To define good performance as hitting the budget numbers is a very narrow, mechanical way of defining performance. We need a richer, broader performance language. And last but not least, something I've called conflict of purposes that some of you may not have thought about. I'll come back to that problem a little bit later. I have been sharing this list of problems with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the 25 years I've been working with Beyond Budgeting. And do you know what? Most people agree, even if executives, even finance people agree that this is a pretty flawed process. At the same time, most organizations continue doing this stupid stuff, even if it is changing these days, as I will come back to. One reason could be that these problems are regarded more like irritating itches and not symptoms of anything more systemic and deeper and bigger as a problem. But that is exactly what these problems are. Symptoms of a very big problem, which is also a paradox. Because here we are looking at a process invented roughly a hundred years ago. It's pretty old management technology we are talking about. And in case you don't know, the inventor was Mr. James O. McKinsey, the founder of McKinsey Consulting. I never met the guy, but I actually don't think he was an evil guy. I think he had the best of intentions. He wanted to help organizations perform better. And it probably worked quite well 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago. But today, this way of thinking, this way of managing, is doing exactly the opposite. It has become more of a barrier 
than a support for great performance. And that, my friends, I would call a pretty big problem. We are back to this important word, performance. And some of you know that I, use, I like to use traffic as a metaphor for that discussion about uh, how, how can we get the best possible performance. Because in traffic, when we are out driving, we would also like to experience good performance, a safe and good flow. This is something we often meet, put up by traffic authorities when there is crossing traffic. The one who makes decisions here, who decides about when you can drive, when you have to stop, the one who is in control, is the one who programmed this light. And where would that person be as you sit there waiting for the green light? Somewhere else. I don't think there is anybody sitting inside that pole. I never checked, but I don't think so. And the information this programming would be based on would not be entirely fresh information as you sit there waiting. It would be some historical trends, some forecasts, but not entirely fresh information. But again, the best of intentions. Fortunately, we have an alternative. A very different solution, exactly the same purpose. We are talking about the roundabout. Here, we make decisions as drivers, and the information we use to make these decisions is fresh, real-time, here and now information. So, very different answers to these questions, so it could be interesting to compare these two ways of managing. And I've got a few leading questions for you here. Um, which is most efficient? Well, it's proven scientifically. The roundabout is not just more efficient, it's also safer. Which is most difficult to drive in? Which takes most competence? And of course, it's the roundabout. And going back to our organizations, everything we need to leave behind of traditional management is in many ways easier for everybody involved, especially managers, compared to what we need to move towards. But we can't go for what's easy, because it's easy. We have to go for the stuff that's good for performance, even if it takes a little bit more from us. If there is a value set among drivers waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest. That is normally not a big problem in front of that light, overruled, hopefully, by red. In the roundabout, me first, don't care about the rest, can actually be a big problem. Because here, we are much more dependent on everybody involved sharing a positive wish or purpose of wanting this to flow well. We have to help each other. We have to interact with each other in a very different way than what we need to do in front of that light. So it's not enough with fresh information, authority to act on it. You also need a positive value set. Two other relevant words here. Trust, obviously, in front of that light. We are not trusted in the roundabout. We are. Transparency is not important in front of that light, as long as you can see the color of the light. But in the roundabout, you need to be able to see the entire uh, situation in order to make your decision. I'm quite sensitive to words uh, in the corporate language, and there are some words and labels I don't like very much. One of those is performance management. The reason for that is that first, I find it quite negative. What we actually are saying is that if we don't manage your performance, there will be no performance. I don't think that's true. Second, I think there's some illusion into this. I think our ability to manage performance in today's business and people realities is somewhat limited compared to what many managers and finance and HR people like to think. But performance management is a label that fits nicely when we talk about the traffic light. That's exactly what traffic authorities are doing. They are managing performance very directly. In the roundabout, it is about something else. Here, it is about creating conditions for great performance to take place. It is about enabling performance, not managing performance. And this is more than playing with words. These are two fundamentally different ways of addressing that important question. How do we get the best possible performance in our organizations? The roundabout is a more self-regulating management model. And self-regulation is another important word here, because in today's business and people realities, organizations need more self-regulating management models for at least two reasons. First, our business environment 
with all the VUCA out there, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. If we take that VUCA level seriously, it must have implications for the design of our management model compared to if there is little or no VUCA out there. That should be quite obvious. The other reality we need to reflect on is not external, it's internal. It has to do with people. It has to ask ourselves, it is about asking ourselves, what kind of people do we generally believe that we have in our organization? And uh, many of you will be familiar with uh, uh, Douglas McGregor and his theory X and Y, and these two opposing views on people and what motivates people. You know, theory X, that uh, most people is a bunch of, or most employees, is a bunch of potential thieves and crooks. And unless we manage tightly, we know what will happen. They will all run away, do a lot of stupid things, and spend money like drunken sailors. Well, McGregor, he was a bit more polite and academic in his book, but I think that's what he meant. Then you have this theory why, this much more positive view on people, a view that most people actually want to, be to perform, want to be involved, want to be listened to, want to be treated as adults. And we don't need to agree so far on where our sympathy lies, X or Y, even if I have a certain hope. But it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in X, our management model should look very different compared to if we mainly believe in Y. If we combine these two, it could look like this. You recognize the two dimensions. And traditional management lies in that lower left hand corner with a conscious or unconscious assumption that the world is still a planable, predictable place and that most people is on the X side. If we disagree with that, then this is not the, then that, this is not the place to be. We need to move up in that upper right hand corner by addressing both people in leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of traditional management, something that's very rigid, detailed, annual, a lot of rules-based micromanagement, centralized command and control, and a strong belief in secrecy and sticks and carrots as ways to drive performance. So what do we need to do in order to get out of traditional management? On the leadership side, we need to be not just more values-based, but also more purpose-based. There has to be more autonomy. In this VUCA world, there isn't always time to run nine floors up to get that decision, because then it can be too late. And with these people on board, very often they can make good decisions for themselves. Transparency, here comes that important word again. And in this context, this is good news for scared managers who are afraid of losing control. Because transparency can actually be quite an effective control mechanism, a social control mechanism. Quick example from Swiss Roche, Roche Pharmaceutical, uh, who today, by the way, are on a beyond budgeting journey. They did a very interesting experiment some years ago on travel cost. In a pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, all travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So with a few exceptions, everybody could see everything. What do you think happened with travel cost in that pilot? People could see if you traveled, to where did you fly, sleep, eat, cheap or expensive. Cost came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism. This was about tearing all pages in the rules book instead of doing the opposite. But let me add on here, transparency is a powerful mechanism. It must be applied with wisdom. If it becomes naming and shaming, it doesn't work. And we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a control perspective. How can we learn from each other if everything is secret? Last but not least, internal intrinsic motivation as opposed to external extrinsic motivation. And the most common external motivation tool in business today is, in, is individual bonus. And I hope I don't... I hope you know, and I guess you know, that there is probably no area where there's a bigger gap between what most research is telling us and what most businesses are practicing. Because research is telling us that individual bonus can work if three conditions are in place. Little motivation in the job itself, if it's easy to count and measure, and if quantity is more important than quality. So for chasing rats, picking fruit, maybe, maybe some simple trade sales work, maybe, it works. But moving to knowledge work, then, as you all know, mastery, autonomy, purpose, belonging, and other things related to leadership is much more powerful. So individual bonus, I would call it managerial laziness. 
do this and get that, instead of, uh, of showing true leadership. Many organizations have the best of intentions when it comes to people, in what they say and what they write. But it doesn't help to have these theory Y leadership visions if you have theory X management processes, which is the case in many companies. So what we need to do here, if we have a theory Y view, is to change your management processes to make sure they reflect that people view, while at the same time making these management processes more VUCA robust. Here are some examples. Typically, the traditional detailed annual budget, it has to go, or be significantly changed, because it represents so much of what we find in that lower left -hand corner. More specifically, when we are setting target goals, if we shall have them, that's a separate discussion, we should think more like in football. I have yet to meet a football team saying that the ambition for next season is to score 45 goals and get 42 points. Those are budget goals, and they don't think like that. They think in terms of league tables. It's all about doing well against peers and competition. When it comes to the rhythm of these processes, we must, where it's possible, organize them on a more business-driven, event-driven rhythm and less of a calendar-driven rhythm. And, last but not least, we can never reduce performance evaluation to being about comparing two numbers and then conclude. We need this richer, broader language. And this, my friends, was a crash course in Beyond Budgeting. This is what it is about. It is this simple and this difficult, addressing both leadership and management processes in order to become more adaptive, more human, or more agile, if you want. This is business agility in practice. A number of organizations are today on this journey in some form or shape, and I could have spent the rest of today and also tomorrow sharing with you fascinating stories of management innovation. We don't have the time, so two quick examples. Let's start in Norway. In the upper right-hand corner, you see a company called Miles, Norwegian IT company, business in the Baltics, uh, beyond Norway, Baltics, uh, South Africa, India. Miles have no targets, no budgets. If you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as expensive as you want, replace it as often as you want. No PC budgets. You can attend whatever conference training you want, as often as you want, wherever in the world. No training budgets, no travel budgets. But it's not an anarchy. When you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that training, you have to post on the internet what you did and the cost of it. So, transparency, the only, only control mechanism, nothing else. And trust me, it works. And how is the company doing? Great. Growing, yes. Never a goal in itself, just a consequence of doing well. Let's move to a bigger company, a pioneer within Beyond Budgeting. In the middle, at the top, you see a bank, a Swedish bank called Handelsbanken that has no budgets, no targets, no individual bonus, and they have been operating like this since 1970, with a lot of autonomy, a lot of decentralization, a lot of transparency. And how has this impacted the bank's performance? Well, it's simply amazing. This bank has been performing better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. This bank is among the most cost-effective universal banks in Europe, and this bank has never needed any bailout from the authorities because they messed it up. It can't be a coincidence. This radically different management model for so many years and so radically better performance than the average of competitors. Fascinating case. And this bank, together with some other companies, inspired what became known and formulated as beyond budgeting in the late 90s, three years before the Agile Manifesto, but you will see that there are many similarities. These are the 12 principles. There's no time to go into detail on all of this, but just a few reflections here. Um, as you can see, we are addressing both leadership and management processes with a strong focus on creating coherence between what we preach on the left-hand side, what we practice on the right-hand side. A classical example of the opposite. It doesn't help that we on the left-hand side talk loud and warm about how fantastic people we have on board, and we would be nothing without you, and we trust you so much. 
but not that much. Of course, we need detailed travel budgets. Are you crazy? Hypocrisy is what I call it. Poisonous gaps between what we preach and what we practice. The words become hollow because the processes have the opposite message. On the leadership side, I have touch been touching upon a few of these already. Purpose, values, uh, transparency, autonomy. I'll come back to some of these management processes uh, in, a, uh, in a minute, actually, on the, the, uh, the next slide. Uh, these principles are principles. This is not the management recipe. And that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes, because in a management recipe, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you have to do is to buy the books and read them, by the way, hire the consultants, tick the boxes. I find that a bit boring and also a bit dangerous. Here you have to think for yourself, what shall this mean for us, given our business, our culture, our history? So it's not identical what has happened in all those organizations, but that is the way it should be. Some people find these principles, especially finest people, <laughs> find these, people, uh, these principles a bit big, a bit scary, especially when they see them for the first time. But I have some good news for scared people. There is a simple way to get started. And this will be the closest to a finance lesson we come in this session, because I want to remind you about the fact that the budget is used for three different things in a company. Budgets are used to set targets, financial targets, sales targets, production targets. At the same time, a budget is a kind of forecast of what next year can look like in terms of cash flow, financial capacity. And last but not least, it is a resource allocation process. We are handing out bags of money to the organization on operating costs and investments. And it might seem very efficient to solve all three in one process and one set of numbers. But that's also the problem. And here is why. Imagine we are moving into a budget process. Finance upstairs want to understand next year's cash flow. They start asking people responsible on the revenue side, what's your best number for next year? But everybody knows that the number I'm sending upstairs will come back to me as a target, maybe with a bonus attached. That insight might do something to the level of numbers submitted. Moving to the cost side investments, Everybody knows that the number I'm, that this is my only chance of getting access to resources for next year. And some also maybe remember that 20% cut from last year. And that memory and that insight might also do something to the level of numbers submitted. And this is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but even more because it stimulates unethical behaviors. The lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, and so on. Fortunately, there is a very simple solution. We can continue to do this, this stuff, but in three separate processes, because these are not the same. A target is an aspiration, what we want to happen. A forecast is an expectation, what we think will happen. And resource allocation is about optimizing scarce resources to get to where we want to be. And when we have separated, we can start to improve each one in ways that I don't have to go into detail here. But um, um, what I can tell you is that um, on what many companies do on resource allocation, on investment, is to apply a kind of continuous delivery approach on decisions and financial resources. Um, so not on software functionality, but on, on uh, oh yeah, money and, and decisions. Um, at Equinor, for, for instance, there is no annual detailed investment budget where you have decided up front we are going to invest exactly this much, spit exactly on these projects, and then you hand out the money. Instead, the concept says the bank is always open. The line can always forward a project for approval. Yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project and can we afford it, can we afford it as things look today? Dynamic resource allocation. And last but not least, when we have separated, we can organize each one on a rhythm better suited to the individual purpose and also the kind of business we are in. Okay. Uh, yeah, by the way, if some, if some finance people tell you that it's impossible to operate without a budget, show them this slide and tell them that here we are still doing what the budget tried to do for us, but because we've separated, we can do all of these things in much better ways. So, how does Equinor apply all of these? Um, 
energy company, Scandinavia's uh, largest, where I used to work until for uh, just a few weeks ago. So with a heavy heart, I have left this company to be able to work with Beyond Budgeting full time. But I had a great time, and I'm very grateful for that time. The process in Equinor is called Ambition to Action. Three purposes, translating strategy, also managing risk, securing agility, and also activating what the company believes in when it comes to values and leadership principles. Some steps in this process, it starts with translating strategy into strategic objectives. That, so what does success look like on a medium-term time horizon, mostly expressed in words? What are the risks of not achieving these objectives, other type of risks? What kind of actions do we need to move towards these objectives, to mitigate risk, very often one and the same thing? So one process, one common uh, global system. Um, then it's time for measurement, measuring that we are moving towards these strategic objectives. And note that we have called, the headline here does not say KPI, it says indicators. The reason for that is that we must never forget that the I in KPI stands for indicator. They are indicating something, but not necessarily telling the full truth. They are not called KPTs, Key Performance Truth. They are called Key Performance Indicators, and we must never forget. Last but not least, what does this mean for you and me and the teams that we are in? So here we are straight into the HR process. And here is an example of activating the most impo important principle in this company, which says that how we deliver is as important as what we deliver. And with how we deliver, we are talking about the values in the company and the weighting between the what and the how in all consequences for your career and for your pay is 50-50. This is an integrated performance process running quite seamlessly through strategy, risk, finance, HR. We've been working very closely together to make it hang together. Here is an example to make it a bit more tangible. This is a screenshot from a corporate version. They all start with an ambition statement. For Equinor, it's about shaping the future of energy. You recognize the first four steps from the previous slide, and the HR process then following on. Next to each of the five arrows are five perspectives. And the thinking behind here is at the bottom, yes, we want to create value. That will never happen unless we do well towards markets and customers, which never will happen unless we do well on internal operations, which never will happen unless we do well on people and organization, and in this case also on safety, security, and sustainability. Uh, here you can click on anything and come into the data and the data warehouse, and, uh, and you get all the underlying information. There are around 900 of these in the organization. And let me spend a little bit of time on this slide because here are two important principles. First, how to create alignment, the red thread. The easy way is top-down cascading. For corporate, simply to instructing all the way, this is the content of your ambition to action, especially including the numbers and targets. The problem with that top-down cascading is that in our culture, it very easily destroys everything related to ownership, commitment, right? And if that walks out the door, it doesn't help that the numbers add up. So that doesn't work. So instead, we do something called translation to create alignment, which means that when a team out there shall either make a new ambition to action or update the existing one, they would look around. One level up, maybe further up, maybe all the way to corporate, a bit left and right. Uh, and then the team should have a deep and good discussion. What does our ambition to action need to look like in order to support those we have a relationship to? If that translation should go wrong, of course the level above should do what they are paid for, but it's not a problem. And the main reason, I believe, is, again, transparency. All of these ambition to actions are open, accessible for all employees. There should be no place to hide with a stupid ambition to action. So again, transparency as a control mechanism, but just as much as a learning mechanism. We want people to surf around, be inspired, uh, and learn from, um, from others. 
When it comes to Risen, then uh, uh, we want this to run as continuous and self-regulating as possible. So these teams, they can basically change whatever they want on their own ambition to action when there is a need for it. Including targets, if targets have lost their meaning. And again, most of these targets, these guys have set for themselves. But they can change them if they have lost their meaning. Impossible to achieve or piece of cake. But this is not an anarchy. Beyond transparency, there is a very simple control mechanism. If you want to change something that big, you still, then you need to have a talk with the level above. There are no stamps, no signatures, but you need to talk with that level. Um, if uh, your change is small, you just inform at a suitable time. Big or small, always make sure that you inform others which are affected by your changes. This is the coordination part of it. I recall when this was introduced, then people said, big and small, I like that mechanism. But by the way, what is big and what is small? And some had expectations that we should define that at corporate on behalf of everybody. Impossible. So we've delegated that. So it could be that someone in one part has a different definition of big and small than somebody else. But that is okay as long as it works both cases. Back to the roundabout, to the self-regulation. We would like this to run as self-regulating as possible. We would like these teams to experience ambition to action as something they mainly have in order to help themselves to manage themselves. If that runs well, the total results at corporate will be well. So again, self-regulation. Let me finish with this last slide on performance evaluation, a holistic performance evaluation. And holistic here means two things. First of all, the 50-50 between what we deliver and how we deliver, as we talked about. But holistic also means then what, that when we shall evaluate what we have delivered in business terms, then that shall not be an evaluation of the indicators only, on that ambition to action. We should look at the whole ambition to action. And we should also go behind measurement to look at what measurement did not pick up by asking some simple questions. I see that your indicator is green, but have we really moved towards those objectives? When we look at what measurement maybe it didn't pick up, how ambitious were those targets? Should we punish somebody that stretched themselves and didn't completely make it? And do the opposite with people who lowballed and gamed, maybe, and made it? Has there been significant changes in assumptions, headwind, tailwind of such a nature, that we should take it into account? Was there an earthquake in Japan making that logistics operation difficult? Was there a competitor going bankrupt, making that sales uh, ambition a piece of cake? I mean, all the things we know afterwards that we don't know up front. Why on earth should we ignore that? It's only when we have through, been through these questions that we can have a view on what kind of performance are we looking at. Um, and the purpose of this evaluation is uh, mainly learning and development. There is also a reward component, which we have been making smaller and smaller over the years. Um, and we also used to have, like many companies, a, a rating scale from one to five. Nobody uh, liked it, most people hated it, so we, we kicked it out. And it worked perfectly well without a rating scale. Today, our starting point is that if you work for Equinor, you are a solid performer. There are some stars, we will take care of you. There are some people who struggle, we will address that. But let's not, let's not waste time by rating and ranking people or discussing that for hours and hours. Are you this or are you that? All right, this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, these are my coordinates. Um, if you want to get in touch, uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, highly appreciated. I only tweet about this stuff and write about this stuff. There are no cats and dogs and grandchildren, I promise. And um, check out the Beyond Budget and Roundtable. Uh, and if you want, also my new and very simple uh, website. What you, have <laughs> what, what you have heard is the short version of all of this. If you're even more interested, uh, this is the long version. Uh, more of everything on problems, beyond budgeting, more cases, uh, stuff we did in a company called Borealis, where we kicked out the budget in 95 before there was anything called beyond budgeting. 
and more about beyond budgeting in Agile because there are so many similarities, and obviously much more about the implementation, which I didn't have time to talk about today. And my last words is, and you know, that what I have been talking about today, it will happen. I don't care if it will be called beyond budgeting, business agility or whatever, it will happen. And in 15, 20 years time, maybe earlier, when we look back at what was mainstream management in 2021, I think we will smile, even have a laugh. Just like we today smile about the days before the internet. And how long is that? And as organizations, we can choose to be early movers, vanguards, to get a competitive advantage, or we can choose to be dragged into this as one of the last ones. I think that should be a pretty simple choice. Thank you very much. Vous avez des questions? On a cinq minutes pour prendre des questions. And thank you very much. Um, for organizations that um, haven't yet understood beyond budgeting, that are like more classical ones, um, what's the trigger usually in organizations to start thinking differently? Mm. Um, yeah. What's the best way to inspire them? Yeah. It's a good question, and there are many. I mean, one positive thing is that today so many are on an agile transformation in some form or shape. And they all discover at one point that we will never succeed unless we also address the stuff I've been talking about here, especially on the budget side. Agile transformation without this, forget it. So that's one trigger. The other trigger is that that list of companies is getting longer by the day. Uh, today, I had a meeting with uh, Pernod Ricard, who had decided to go on a beyond budgeting journey, so uh, it won't be long before they are on that list. And when, you know, when executives see that stuff is happening with competitors, that tends to trigger some interest. Um, but last but not least, again, if this stuff is too big and scary, start with the separation of the budget purposes. Any CFO will understand the problems with combining, understanding the logic of separating, and uh, it's not risky, pure logic. But once you have separated, you start to discuss how we can improve, you are on a roll. So it's a great way to get started. I have helped around 30 companies on that list to get started. And with most of them, that is where we started. Um, speaking of getting started by splitting the budget uh, roles, I'm having trouble imagining pitching to my CFO that he can no longer predict any sort of cash flow the expectation part, could you, I don't know, give us some tips on that? Well, then I was unclear when I was explaining okay. the separation. Because in the forecasting process, he will forecast or get forecast on cash flow. And the forecast he gets will be much better. They will be unbiased. We've taken the politics out of forecasting. Because here, a forecast is just a forecast. It's not a bid into a target negotiation. It's not an application for resources. It's just a forecast. We have removed the reasons for gaming on that forecast. So that CFO will be very happy, because now we can trust the numbers much more when we shall communicate with the market or do any kind of other planning. So um, I was probably unclear, but um, I promise, much better forecasts. He will be very happy. On a le temps pour une dernière. Hi, thanks. Uh, it was great. I have a question. Uh, for smaller structure, around 10 to 25 people, uh, isn't it scary to apply beyond budgeting when each year count? You know what? I think small companies are born beyond budgeting. They become something else often when they want to grow. Because then they start to look at what are the big companies doing or what kind of processes. They ask, ask the consultants what do I need to in order to grow. And then they start to kind of in introduce and implement all these, not just budgeting, but I mean compliance processes and uh, you name it, the list is long. 
And then one day, they might have become big, but they also discover that we have not only become big, we have also become slow, rigid, all the things that we don't want to be. And I find an interesting parallel here to the aging process of man. Because as we get older, we do lose a bit of that agility we had as teenagers, at least on the physical side, and maybe a bit of here as well. And I know what I'm talking about. Uh, and when it comes to man, you know, we have no choice. But organizations have a choice. It's written nowhere, but, but because you are big, you should be slow and rigid. So I think while well, the big question for big companies should be how can we uh, be big and small at the same time, the big question for small companies should be how can we grow without ending up in the same misery. And Miles, the company I talked about, they are succeeding because they are so aware of not falling into the trap of big management stuff simply because they are growing. So as a small organization, you probably are pretty beyond budgeting uh, where you are today. Just make sure that you keep it. Thank you, Barthe.